Good afternoon, my name is Graham Betcher and I serve as Executive Director of the Birmingham Museum of Art. I'd like to thank you for joining me this afternoon for my director's cut on Dale Chihuly's uh, site-specific work, Birmingham Persian Wall, which co was commissioned by the Birmingham Museum of Art back in 1995 and installed in January of 1996. Um, before I talk about the specifics of that commission uh, and a little bit of background about uh, Dale Chihuly and his practice and also his inspiration uh, for this work, uh, I want to uh, show you exactly where we are. You can see the, uh, the work itself sort of hovering, uh, you know, halo-like or maybe uh, kind of a, more like a, a floral wreath above my head. Uh, that's completely uh, coincidental. Um, but I want to take you uh, in close uh, so that we can look at the work um, as closely as I can possibly get us uh, and uh, look at some of the wonderful um, sort of consequences of how it's displayed uh, with the, the light passing through and some of the magnificent reflections um, that we get. So let me flip the, uh, flip the view. Here we are in the museum's main lobby off of uh, Reverend Abraham Woods Jr. Uh, Boulevard. And uh, I'm gonna get us in close. Now, as I mentioned, the title of this work is Birmingham Persian Wall. And it's quite a large work. It consists of multiple uh, blown uh, glass forms uh, installed throughout both sides of the lobby. And it was a, a bit of a Herculean uh, effort to acquire this. Um, although I would say that, you know, Birmingham was rather early in acquiring uh, Chihuly's uh, work. There are many, uh, many museums who subsequently uh, have acquired his work. The Museum of Fine Arts Boston has a prominent piece in their lobby that was installed when they um, reimagined their American wing, uh, and uh, he, closer to home, I believe the, the Jewel Colin Smith Museum at Auburn uh, has a, a piece by Chihuly in their lobby as well, um, and that's a more recently constructed uh, museum uh, building. Um, can't remember the exact uh, date, but maybe in the early 2000s. So this, I just want to show you the uh, what we call the, the tombstone with all the relevant information for this work. Birmingham Persian Wall, 1995 to 1996. Dale Chihuly, American uh, from Tacoma, Washington, uh, my home state. Uh, I was uh, born a, a little bit uh, further up Interstate 5 in Bellingham. But I, what I really wanted you to see is this credit line. Museum purchase with funds from Ruth and Marvin Engel, and that's the east side of the building, George W. Barber Jr. Foundation, the west side, the Art Fund Incorporated, the Blunt Foundation, the Day Family Foundation, members of the Birmingham Museum of Art, the museum store, Dr. and Mrs. John W. Pointer, the Steislinger Foundation, Dr. and Mrs. Kenneth B. Taylor, and Vulcan Materials Company Foundation for the uh, center section against the windows. Uh, so I read all of that to, to make the point that, you know, that expression, it takes a village, this is, is one really great instance where in order to make this happen for our institution and for our city, it took many, many p individuals and foundations and corporate foundations uh, coming together uh, for the good of the, the community uh, and, it just, and to glorious uh, results. So let's walk up the stairs, and if for some reason we should happen to lose the signal, I want you to just bear with me. I'm, I will reconnect as soon as possible. Uh, this first landing of the you know, original uh, stairs, we're in the uh, main lobby of the museum, which is part of the original 1959 structure designed by Warren Knighton Davis. I want to say more about that in just a moment. But I want you to be able to appreciate uh, that, you know, the beauty of this work is not just the glass forms themselves, but the lighting effects that you get 
when the light pierces these forms. It's really, it almost, it looks like waves or even petals uh, of a flower. Um, if you think of a very kind of densely uh, packed flower, like a, like a marigold or something like that. Uh, and I'll show you that up, up high, and then I'll turn the corner. Also, I think you can, some of you are familiar with uh, Dale Chihuly's uh, sort of sea forms or aquatic forms that draw inspiration from different, you know, sea creatures. Uh, some of these, at least with, when you consider the object themselves and their uh, reflection, they almost end up looking like uh, Portuguese man-of-war or jellyfish. Um, really stunning, especially that blue form. And we'll look up. And then we're going to walk up the <laughs> staircase, and I've got to keep an eye on my feet while I'm walking up to make sure that I don't bite the dust going up these stairs. Museum director breaks neck while giving tour of Dale, Dale Chihuly's work in Alabama. More at 11. Let's hope that's not the case. So i got to watch where I'm going. Uh, but then and this gives you also a sense of how they're attached. So there are um, kind of thick rods, um, uh, glass rods at the end of each of these forms where they, they, they taper out and the rods that are used to, to um, blow the glass and, and, and turn it are, um, you know, come together in a kind of a tapered and fused uh, point. And that's what's used to attach these to the wall and these little anchors. So a little bit of the engineering behind them. And then we'll come up here, and then I'm gonna take us all the way up high. I'm gonna hope we don't lose the signal. I'm gonna turn around once I've walked up the stairs. I don't dare turn beforehand. And this is the view that I wanted to give you. This is about as close, and with my arms stretched all the way out, and I'm uh, just over six feet tall. This is about as close as I can get you um, to these forms. And you see even up here the beautiful lighting effect. So this is as you descend um, from the uh, second floor down to the first floor. So I wanted to give you that kind of intimate exploration of the forms before I talk a little bit about um, how they came to be here at the B Birmingham Museum of Art. As you can imagine, um, cleaning these uh, is an equally uh, sort of gargantuan feat. Uh, it, we clean them, you know, as often as, as necessary, but that requires our preparators um, getting up on uh, scaffolding and being very, very careful um, not to you know, accidentally jostle them or dislocate them. Um, so they're, you know, they are sturdy, but we have to remember this is glass and fragile and needs to be handled um, with due care. All right, here we go. I'm watching my feet again, lest I tumble down the stairs and we're coming back down into the main lobby. Okay. Mission accomplished. Now, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Dale Chihuly and about how these works uh, came to be at the Birmingham Museum of Art. I think, as I've already said, uh, Dale Chihuly is from Washington State, um, from Tacoma. Uh, he studied, uh, started off studying at what is now at the University of Puget Sound. I think back then it was the College of Puget Sound. Uh, he then went on to the uh, University of Washington. Um, that's where he first learned um, to work with glass. Um, but his degree there, I believe, was in interior design. Uh, but he, he knew that he wanted to work with glass, and he event eventually went out to Madison, to the University of Wisconsin, and worked with one of the kind of foremost studio glass artists in the United States at that time, a real kind of legendary figure among glass artists, uh, that being Harvey Littleton. Uh, he had the opportunity um, later to study in Venice 
Um, this was a really transformative experience uh, for him. Uh, and it, it's those kind of, you know, traditional techniques um, and effects that he learned there and brought back with him and incorporated in his own work. Um, though I think that uh, some would say that he made it uh, distinctly his own, you know, this sort of, you know, breaking away from, uh, you know, functionality. I think some of you know who've been to, to Venice and experience um, the uh, glass tradition there. And I will just mention uh, a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Alex Mann, who is the curator of uh, prints and drawings at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. He is working on a major exhibition that looks at American artists in uh, Venice, and particularly America, a, a kind of a, a vein in that exhibition is kind of American artist fascination with the glass uh, tradition uh, there that is so time honored. Um, but I think some, most would say that, that uh, Chihuly made it his own. Uh, and what, you know, he may have learned traditional techniques, uh, but uh, he kind of, you know, threw, threw out all the rules or incorporated forms that were part of his upbringing. Um, if you think of the Pacific Northwest um, and the Puget Sound, I, we, you know, both he and I, um, you know, the water, you, we grew up in a place where you're really defined by your relationship to the water, and even though these aren't his his sea forms, though some of them I think are quite evocative and similar to his uh, sea forms, um, you can see that, you know, how he might have drawn inspiration from the natural world around him. Now, one, in terms of his uh, inspiration, uh, I know that our, our curator, uh, Ron Platt, uh, who's now in, um, uh, at the Grand Rapids uh, Art Museum, um, when he was here in Birmingham, we published on the occasion of our 60th anniversary a, a new handbook of the collection, um, which included an entry on Birmingham Persian Wall. And Ron made the point that uh, the forms you see here uh, may have been uh, drawn or uh, inspired by uh, the uh, irregularly scalloped um, edges and folds of uh, Dale Chihuly's mother's flower garden. And so this is, a, you know, it, I like this idea very much. Um, it is, you know, it makes it very personal, you know, the idea that uh, Dale Chihuly uh, would have been, you know, influenced by something he grew up with, um, someone close to him, uh, and that's, that's a very, very nice association. I'll talk in just a moment, though, about kind of the title, Birmingham Persian Wall, um, because there's something, um, you know, kind of ra rather specific that he said about that, um, which, uh, you know, kind of takes things in a, in a slightly uh, different direction. Um, but uh, in terms of how this came to be here uh, at the Birmingham Museum of Art, oh, and I'll just mention before I get into the commission, um, I, I don't think that it uh, is unknown to many of you that, um, that Dale Chihuly uh, co-founded a, a school of glass, uh, the Pilchuck Glass School, which is right near where I grew up. It's in uh, Stanwood, Washington. We used to play Stanwood uh, in football in high school. We were, we were rivals. Uh, so that's right where I grew up. And Mount, uh, it's named for nearby Mount Pilchuck. And the Pilchuck Glass School um, has really become a, a leader uh, in keeping this uh, tradition, this important artistic and craft tradition alive, um, being an innovator. Uh, and so it's uh, really an, an important, uh, important place. And that was in uh, 1971, and it uh, continues uh, to this day. Um, in terms of Dale Chihuly's uh, form uh, or manner of, of practicing uh, his, his art, uh, I think some of you know that he no longer, um, you know, uh, blows or, or um, handles the glass uh, himself. Uh, and there's a very specific reason for this. He's sort of entered into the kind of grand workshop tradition uh, that one would find in, uh, in, in the Renaissance. 
uh, in terms of, of artists overseeing uh, a number of uh, other very highly skilled artists and, and craftsmen. And that's certainly not unique to Dale Chihuly today. Think of the artist Jeff Koons, um, who has a, a warehouse just filled with, with artists painting um, things that he has conceived of and, 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 uh, and, 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 and imagined. Um, and that's much the same way that, that Dale uh, Chihuly works. The reason why he no longer um, you know, uh, blows the, and handles the glass himself, uh, in 1976, he was uh, in England and he was involved in a head-on um, car collision and was propelled through the windshield. And he, his face was um, very badly cut by the windshield glass and he was blinded in his left eye, which is why um, he wears the, the eye patch uh, that I think any of you who have ever seen a, a photo of him, you know, he's always wearing um, the eye patch. Well, he also, as he was, um, after he recovered, he continued um, to, to blow glass um, but he then, uh, and I don't know if it was, it was a result of injuries sustained uh, in that accident, um, he, oh, actually, I take it back, I, I the reason, he was actually body surfing, and then he dislocated um, a, a shoulder, his right shoulder, um, so <laughs> it, it, it very adventurous, I, I've never tried my hand at body surfing, I had a Bad, uh, bad time boogie boarding as a kid in Hawaii, so that was it with that. But um, after he dislocated um, his right shoulder, because uh, the work of being a glass artist and, and handling the material and handling the pipe is, is quite, um, quite rigorous and, and quite requires a lot of strength, um, he was unable to do that anymore. So he hired others to do the work, uh, and in his words, uh, in a 2006 interview, um, he said, once I stepped back, I liked the view, end quote. And all of what I'm kind of recounting to you is included in, in one of the many biographies um, out there online. This one happens to be drawn from, from Wikipedia, which for, you know, even though it's a, a crowdsourced, uh, uh, you know, uh, database, it, it, it's increasingly um, accurate because um, a lot of museums hire Wikipedians um, to uh, push content uh, to that platform. We've actually done the same thing, which is why you'll find a lot of work in our permanent collection included in Wikipedia entries. That's a little aside. Um, so let's talk about how this work uh, came to be in the Birmingham Museum of Art. and. Um, there was a push in the mid-90s uh, to uh, collect glass for the Birmingham Museum of Art. Studio glass was, was very, very hot at that time, um, and I could see why. It's very colorful, it's very alluring, and at the time that uh, this work was unveiled, uh, some of you will remember there used to be all around us um, on these walls, and you know, filled with uh, works by other contemporary glass artists. Um, we removed those several years ago because we use this for exhibition space. This also occasionally serves as the title wall for special exhibitions in our Pazitz Gallery. Um, most recently on this wall, we've had uh, the work of, of local, uh, local uh, mural, local artists who've done large scale murals um, over the last couple of years. Uh, and it has just in the last week been painted white um, to serve as a kind of a fresh tableau for another major art project um, that's coming. And I'm not going to ruin the surprise. I am going to invite my colleagues, uh, Emily Hanna and Hallie Ringel, to speak about that project uh, in the coming weeks. But uh, big, big things uh, on the, on the uh, horizon here. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, but at the time the, the Chihulis were installed, uh, there, was, um, uh, there was other glass in, in the lobby, and this was really meant to be the, the centerpiece, and, and does serve as the centerpiece of the Birmingham Museum of Art's glass um, collection. 
Often we think of this institution as a place with a, you know, a particularly important collection of ceramics, and that is true, but we also have a very fine glass collection, albeit not quite as large as our ceramics collection, but some really choice pieces, and this is one of the, the, the uh, crown jewels or centerpieces of that uh, collection. Well, you know, Dale Chihuly, uh, some of you have maybe seen videos, and I'll see if I can find some and post them um, on the, the Facebook uh, comment section after I post this video. Uh, but he uh, often makes these very quick, very immediate, sometimes messy looking drawings. Um, you know, he'll get down on the floor with a big sheet of paper and, and, and start you know, drawing very quickly and kind of there's an immediacy uh, to his, his designs and also a playfulness as well. And so it was our uh, then curator of decorative arts, uh, Briding Adams, um, whom some of you uh, may know, Briding uh, for, for many years uh, stewarded the uh, Beeson collection and it was Briding that worked with Dale Chihuly um, on this commission. And I was able to find in the object file the, the fax, remember those things, fax machines, that Dale Chihuly sent Briding. And I'm going to read it to you. Here it is. Dear Briding, thinking about your lobby. And this was written on the 18th of March, 1995. And you can see it's from the Chihuly studio on, in North Lake Way in Seattle. Dear Briding, thinking about your lobby, had a very nice time in Birmingham. I told Halo, whoever that is, about your artist in residence program, if he, has, if he is interested. Uh, come on out for a visit to the boathouse, his studio, till we meet again, uh, Chihuly. Okay, and with that, and here's the original, remember these, the fax transmission pages from the Chihuly studio. And I was told that, at, I think it might have been at this time, that the, the city only had one fax machine initially and you had to go over to City Hall and re retrieve faxes. So I, I'm not sure if this dates to, to exactly that time or if this was a few years later when we had by, hopefully by then gotten our own fax machine. But that's just interesting to think about that form of communication versus the instant communication we have with email and text messaging these days. And this is the drawing that he included. Remember I said very playful, very quick, sometimes maybe even a little messy looking. And it says Birmingham Museum of Art. And then there you see all of the forms, um, you know, as they exist in their final iteration. But then he's also included uh, some uh, onlookers, some visitors. One says, fabuloso. Another says, very cool, incredible. Lobby looks great. That's hot. Wow, what color. And then two people are detractors. Someone says, that's ugly. And someone else says, so what? <laughs> Which, uh, you know, gives you a sense of his uh, an idea of his sense of humor, which I appreciate. Well, you know, the, everyone was so taken with this concept that when in January of that year, uh, there was an unveiling ceremony, they actually decided to reproduce the original drawing on the invitation. And you can see, here it is, uh, Thursday, January 18th. Uh, and that was in early 1996, cocktails and dinner to celebrate the unveiling. Very exciting. Um, now, at the, I wanna read to you just briefly uh, what uh, Birmingham's leading uh, arts uh, critic, uh, some of you know uh, Jim Nelson, James R. Nelson, who was for many, many years um, the uh, arts critic for the Birmingham uh, news and uh, in fact when I arrived here in Birmingham he was the very first person to write a review of one of my uh, one of my exhibitions and a little aside uh, when he moved several years ago I bought 
his Lucite coffee table because <laughs> I thought that's just a nice way of thinking of the person who really gave one of my shows its first exposure in Birmingham to, you know, re you know remember him every time I have and think of him every time I have uh, coffee sitting at that, that table. So that's a, a little aside. Um, tells you something about maybe how sentimental I can be. But I, I want to read you what he wrote uh, shortly after that opening event. He wrote, Joyous, whimsical, witty, and graceful, the blown glass blossoms by Dale Chihuly drift across the upper reaches of the museum lobby like windflowers born on a gentle breeze. Created out of molten glass, the large anemone-shaped platters transform the back wall and window of the, Birmingham, of the museum lobby into a Persian garden of trailing jewels that vibrate with color and light. For those who have waited with varying degrees of patience for something to happen, happen in the cavernous space, the wait has been rewarded, end quote. So I thought, you know, you might in, enjoy um, hearing that. I think he really captures the spirit of it uh, quite, quite beautifully. Now, I mentioned that there's kind of a, 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 a bit more background on why um, Dale Chihuly uh, decided to use the word Persian in the title. And I have to admit, when I first came to, to Birmingham, and I, I grew up quite literally around Dale Chihuly's work. Um, being, when you're in Washington State, you could scarcely walk into the lobby of a, a hotel or, you know, or a, a public building or even some of the, you know, kind of nicer uh, sort of uh, luxury malls in, in Seattle. You could scarcely enter one of those spaces without seeing... Um, uh, an example of, of Chihuly's work, sometimes modest, sometimes very grand. So, you know, I, I was very, very familiar um, with his work growing up, and I even, you know, my grandparents even had examples of work by other, not by Chihuly, but by other uh, Pilchuck School artists in their home. So this is something very familiar to me. But I had to confess that I, I was a little, um, you know, kind of... Uh, I don't want to say perplexed, that's overstating the case, but I was curious why it was called Birmingham Persian Wall, and I was, I, was he trying to, did he have a specific influence of time that he had spent in, in Persia, you know, what was the exact reference there? Because it, it, it is, to me, it seems like a very specific reference. And all of that actually sort of came to light uh, just a few years ago in 2016, when this article appeared uh, in, um, I think it was on Artnet, and it's an article by Brian, I'm not sure if he says Boucher, or some people say Boucher, um, we'll go with Boucher, Brian Boucher, and the title of the article is Glass Master Dale Chihuly in Hot Water Over Statements About His Persian Art. Okay, and I'm gonna just kind of sum up uh, what the article uh, says, or I'll read a little of it for you. It's a brief article. It says, a 1999 work by glass artist Dale Chihuly is in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons as, at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And it goes on to say, um, until recently, the wall text for Persian ceiling offered the artist's explanation of the title. And this is a quote directly from Dale Chihuly. The quote reads, I just like the name Persian. It conjured up the Near East, Byzantine, Far East, Venice, all the history, trades, smells, and senses. It was an exotic name for me, so I just called them Persians, end quote. Goes on to say that the museum has removed the label in question according to the Toronto Star, um, which quotes a statement from the institution. Once the, end quote, once the exhibition installation was complete and the text was seen in context, it became clear that it did not reflect the voice of the museum, nor did it reflect the experience of the work. Um, and the museum told the paper that the description, quote, was provided as part of the exhibition text, end quote, by the organizers of the show, whom representatives of the museum declined to name to Artnet News. The museum also declined to answer any questions. And then it goes on um, to quote uh, Merdad 
Ariana Jad, who is the CEO of Toronto's, Toronto's biennial Tir, Tirjan, or Tirgan Festival of Iranian Culture, who said, quote, ethically, it's just not right. If you can take a word like that to mean whatever you want, you're going to create confusion. If you do that, how are we going to create an understanding and a way to talk to one another, end quote. And so, you know, the, to kind of summarize, um, Chihuly is being taken to task for something that a, a lot of artists did uh, in the 19th century, and some of you are familiar with this term, it's um, uh, Orientalism, and there was a wonderful uh, uh, theoretical text written by Edward Said by that title, Orientalism. And it, Orientalism, to kind of sum it up, is, is sort of trying to, uh, you know, paint uh, the the East uh, in in broad strokes. The East being quote, the quote unquote Orient uh, in in broad strokes as a place of you know mystery and exoticism, and um, you know it is a particularly Western lens. It's a particularly colonial um, lens, and what the um, you know one of the um, objections to this sort of kind of uh, mindset is that it fails to, to treat entire groups of individuals um, individually. And it, it, it becomes a sort of shorthand for very distinct cultures. Um, because, you know, when we think of the part of the world we're talking about, when we're talking about, you know, Asia, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of distinct cultures, languages, art forms, um, literatures, musical traditions, uh, et cetera. And so that, that is kind of a, that's a real shorthand uh, nickel version of, of Orientalism. And so uh, it was, um, you know, the, the critique was based on the idea that, uh, that Dale Chihuly was using the term uh, Persian um, without any real specificity to, you know, historical Persia or, um, or present-day Iran and just using it as a kind of catch-all phrase or a, a euphemism uh, for, a, you know, a, a, a kind of a feeling or look that he was trying to conjure up that seemed, you know, kind of uh, foreign or, or uh, you know, quote-unquote exotic uh, to him. So that's the, that that's basically uh, sums it up. I was very interested uh, to read that. That was not a... I, I, like I said, I was very curious to know where the term um, came from, and I thought, you know, incorrectly that it was something specific, but in fact it was, you know, very generalizing reference, and, and a generalizing ref reference not without um, its critics. Um, and this is something I think that as museum professionals, you know, we need to be increasingly mindful of uh, is, how do we how do we present um, a work of art? How do we, you know, uh, explain you know an artist's intentions, but also being transparent um, about uh, you know the context or, or the mindset or worldview um, with which a, a work of art um, was um, created, and I, certainly you know looking back uh, at some of the historical. Um, collections here. Um, there, there are a lot of places where that's applicable, but also in this case with contemporary works uh, as well. And it's all in the service of being, you know, respectful uh, to the audiences um, we serve and respectful of, of distinct and unique um, cultures. So. I wanted to share that with you. That's a kind of a, you know, like I said, that article dates from 2016 uh, and is not, you know, that was not a critique. I arrived here uh, in 2006 and w was really because, you know, if you look at the label we have, there is no explanation of uh, what, the, what the title means or what it could allude to. And uh, it's just the simple tombstone, as we call it. Um, but I think you know, one, as we rethink our entire collection, we'll, th we'll think more um, and consider, um, you know, how do we present uh, works like this and respond to some of the critiques that have been offered. So anyway, uh, 
the shifting gears, I just want to, I'm just reading some of the comments. Uh, thank you for all of you who are uh, typing. I like what Nancy said. Nancy, love the detractors in the drawing. That's, uh, that's too funny. And I, you know, I guess that's, yes, I, I love that in his drawing too, just to return to it for a moment that, you know, and maybe that is uh, based on, uh, you know, re actual responses he, he, was he, he has received in his career. I can't say, but, uh, you know, art is highly subjective. And especially when he was trying to push the envelope and do something distinct and new, I'm sure at some point that the, the forms itself uh, drew uh, detractors. Um, I, I, I like the comment, looks like butterflies, because I do think sometimes it looks like uh, these very, very colorful creatures uh, hovering over um, the lobby. Um, so, uh, and then I see uh, David Peterson uh, watching in, uh, what a pleasure to see this display on my visits from Sacramento. Thank you, David, thank you for visiting. Leanne, um, you are on David Julie's Wikipedia page to find other installations in our area. Yeah, this, I don't, th I don't, thank you for checking into that. Um, uh, Birmingham Persian Wall may not be listed. I haven't checked. It's, it looks like you did. Uh, we may need to change that, uh, which is easy. That's the beauty of Wikipedia. I'm actually signed up as an editor, so can go in and, and add that, and we can, you know, see what other works um, in the area could be added as well. Um, Holly, thank you for your comment. Interior design uses Persian styles. Um, so maybe he got that from his, his background. Um, that's, a, that's a really, uh, you know, uh, interesting point. And certainly, yeah, there is a, um, in interior design, there is a tradition of borrowing uh, from, from various parts of the, the world uh, and a lot of revival styles that, that may well um, have something to do with it. Uh, did he supervise the installation? Julia, I wish I had the answer for that. Um, you know, I, I'm sure it exists in the files which are thick, and I'll see if I can't find the answer to that, whether he came out himself to oversee the installation or whether he sent a, an army of, uh, of individuals to, to uh, tackle the, the pr uh, project. I'll, I'll find out, and uh, I don't want to speak out of turn without actually knowing the answer to that, um, but I will find out. Um, so with that, I want to just show you, conclude by talking about the rest of the lobby. I think I told you that there are big things in store for this wall, but I have to remember that no one has been in the museum other than staff uh, since Sunday, March 15th at 3.30 p.m. That's exactly when we close. And you will notice some new features. One of the most common critiques that we've gotten of this institution is that when you come into the lobby, it's a little sterile and it doesn't look like an art museum. Well, we have aimed to change that. Um, we have added uh, floor to ceiling banners um, in our lobby on both sides, which is very exciting. Um, and I'm gonna just walk us down the stairs. Again, I'm gonna try not to break a limb. Uh, <laughs> coming down the stairs. But um, when you come in now, you'll see, you know, uh, part of our Carrie James Marshall, you'll see a large sign kind of reminding our visitors in the gentlest terms of, of you know, things we ask them to do and, and not to do in terms of, you know, where you can store your bags and umbrellas and please take notes and sketches and we encourage people to take photos, but obviously we don't pe want people to touch or smoke cigarettes or, you know, or have weapons, uh, some of the kind of very obvious things, uh, but uh, we, we post a reminder. And, uh, and then we've got a piece of Wedgwood and our sergeant from our painting from our Crest collection, from our African collection, and from our Asian uh, collection. So there were some really um, phenomenal, phenomenally colored, colorful banners to, to uh, when you enter, and then this is the this is the the kind of uh, glorious view when you come up the stairs. You really see uh, the splendor of the color of the Birmingham Persian Wall 
um, emerging. And so, and then finally, I want to call attention to something that I'm really, really proud of that I worked on for quite some time, really ever since I became director. Um, you know, equity of access is, is really, really important at this museum. Um, you know, we are very committed to our belief in free admission um, to the uh, permanent collection. Once in a while, we, we charge for special exhibitions. But we, we don't ever want there to be an economic barrier of access um, to coming to, to see our permanent collection. We also don't want there to be physical barriers as well. And so when this um, main uh, building was built, uh, in 1959 and you know later renovated for the longest time if you came in uh, through the entrance on Lynn Park which is the main entrance not the parking lot entrance though that's the most commonly used entrance um, the main entrance had no means of uh, you know wheelchair accessibility and I'm very very pleased to show you uh, the lift that has been installed during the period um, of the, the pandemic. Um, work on this started shortly after um, the museum closed to the public. Um, the contractors all exercised extreme uh, caution in making sure that they followed protocol for their own um, safety and the safety of other people on the premise. But I'm very, very pleased to show you that when this museum opens to the public, whenever that will be, it will be after we have two weeks of statistical flattening in Jefferson County, um, but I can't name exactly when that'll be. That'll just depend a lot on uh, how careful uh, individuals are, are being to, to stop the spread of COVID-19. But I'm pleased that, that our vis visitors who uh, would benefit from um, this lift will have access to, the, to a lift, not just on this side of the building, um, the brand new lift, but the pre-existing lift on the parking lot uh, side of the building. So that, that, that feels, I know it sounds, um, you know, you're probably thinking, gosh, you know, give us more art. Why is he going on and on about a, a lift? But, you know, when you're in this business, um, you know, sometimes what seems like it's a, a small victory, actually, when I, if, if I were to tell you the number of hours and meetings and emails, um, this to me is a, is a big win. Uh, for this institution and the community we serve. So I hope that you will uh, come back and uh, enjoy this kind of newly conceived space as soon as we're open to the public. And until then, I hope you'll continue to join me on Wednesday afternoons at 2 o'clock for my director's cut. Look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. Until then, stay well, um, stay safe, and goodbye. Take care.